you guys are friendly. I get a free iPad just showing up. Um, so, uh, good afternoon. It is very, very nice to be with all of you here. I've, um, I- I'm always a little bit nervous when they give me the afternoon slot. I kind of know what that's like after you've had lunch on a warm day. I was going to be a National Park Ranger when I grew up. That's what I planned my entire childhood. Went to high school and I took biology after lunch. I slept through biology, got a really bad grade, and God used it to be a pastor, which is why I believe in predestination. Um, So it's just my way of saying that um, I will do my best to keep you awake, but if you don't, I think God can use it anyway. Um, And I'm just thrilled to have the chance to be with you. This is kind of an interesting thing. You guys have an interesting way of doing this. I get all the clergy this afternoon and all of the lay people this evening, so what do you want me to tell them? (laughs) <laughs> like, you know, like, so we'll have a Q&A later, and you can just tell me, like, tell my church this, right? Underline that. So I've, been be- I've spent the better part of the last 10 years or so going around the country quoting my favorite quote on leadership. It comes from Ronald Heifetz and Marty Linsky. Leadership is disappointing your own people at a rate they can absorb. And and the reason why I start with this is because I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the challenge of leadership and the way I understand it, and particularly the way that uh, difficult it is to talk about leadership from a biblical perspective. And one of the reasons why it's so difficult is because the scriptures actually don't give us a very good theology of leadership. Indeed, um, the Hebrew Bible professor at our school at, at Fuller Seminary where I work likes to put it this way. He said to me once, Todd, look, there's only one theology of leadership in the Bible. It's this. When God's leading, we're doing okay. When humans are leading, we're not. Yeah. Right? So it reminds us that leadership is always fraught when we start talking about it. But it can be helpful to think about leadership if you compare it to a deeply biblical concept, a concept that's all throughout the scriptures, and that's the concept of management. Of course, in the scriptures, it's usually not called management, it's called stewardship. So in the scriptures, what we have is stewardship or management is taking care of the things entrusted to our care and then delivering them over to other people who will be faithful with them. Taking care of the people that we've been, people, the resources, the traditions, our movement, whatever has been entrusted to us that we have been authorized to take care of and hand over faithfully, usually like to the next generation, that's the kind of stewardship or management that we've been done, that we've been called to do. And one of the ways to think about this is that management is when, pe- when people entrust you to do something and when you accomplish it, when you take them where they want to go, they thank you for doing it. Leadership is when people entrust you with a task, ask you to take them where they, want, where they need to go, and you do it and they resist you because you did it. Leadership is about taking people where they need to go and want to go and say they want to go, and then they get in the way of the going. And so leadership, though it's not talked about theologically, is demonstrated in lots of places, particularly we see like even in the story of Moses, particularly. So as we talk about leadership today, I want to hold this notion of management and leadership together. I'm not one of these people who thinks that management is something easy and leadership is for those of us who are, are somehow specially called. No, we are all called to be good managers and good leaders. When I was a pastor for 17 years in San Clemente, California, one of the things we did every year is we took our high school students, those who were rising seniors, we took them to Yosemite National Park where I would take them on a hike to the top of Half Dome. If you've ever seen Half Dome, it's that iconic half rock mountain that people scale up one side, but you can hike up the backside. It's a 20 mile round trip hike. It's, a, it's daunting because the last 300 yards, you have to go up the side of the, of the rock on, with pulling up on cables. And so I would take the kids every year, we would take a group of kids, leave in the middle of the night, and we would take them all the way to the top of Half Dome. And the first year that I did that, I learned a lesson because what I discovered is about nine miles in, when you've gone uphill the whole time, the cross-country team is in really good shape. And they're the first people always, but I'm the pastor and I had to make sure everybody got up. So when we got to the cables, the cross country team looks at me and says, hey Todd, would it be okay if um, we went up and just met you at the top? 
Like, we'll just get a place for us to have lunch, and we'll gather there, and when you bring up the rest of the kids, then we'll uh, all have lunch together, and then we'll be able to do so. And I said, sure, and a guy named Eric went up to the top, and by the time I got up there, I found Eric sitting at the top of Half Dome with his feet dangling over the edge 3,000 feet down. He was having an amazing, inspiring moment with Jesus. I grabbed him and pulled him back and looked at him and said, Eric, you don't understand. If you fall off, you get to see Jesus. If I fall off, I got to see your mother. That's way, way worse for me. Because when you are in charge of youth, you've got to be a good manager even more than leader. I always tell, say every time I hired a youth leader, I was hiring actually a youth manager. You take 10 kids to camp, you got to bring 10 kids home. 90% is not an A, right? <laughs> So management is crucially important. I'm having a little bit of a hard time with this microphone. Hang on a second. What's that? Is that gone this way? There you go. Sorry. You think I know how to do this. So what, basically what you discover is that management we start with, but leadership is, the, is even more profound because you have to deal with people's own disappointment. Let me talk about how I learned this and one of the reasons why I love talking to Methodists. Because my life changed when I spent some time one afternoon with a group of Methodists in Portland, Maine. When I, went, uh, when I came out of uh, college, I worked for Youth for Christ. I ran uh, campus life clubs. If you're familiar with like Young Life, it's that kind of organization. And I worked with youth and I loved it. And then Hollywood Presbyterian Church invited me onto their staff when I was 23 years old to run their college department. Um, they looked at me and said, look, you're going to run out of those youth talks you do by Christmas. So we're going to send you to seminary so you can learn to teach the Bible. And that was great because I ran out of them by Thanksgiving. So they sent me to seminary and they paid for it. And everywhere I go, I give thanks to that congregation who did so. My former senior pastor, Lloyd Ogilvie, just passed away two days ago. And he has been dear on my heart because at 23 years old, when I was nothing more than brashness and enthusiasm, he took me on his staff. And they, let, they sent me to school and they paid for it. And I ended up getting my MDiv and I went on and got a PhD at Fuller and continued on. My PhD was in spiritual theology. It was in the doc, using the doctrine of the Trinity to talk about Christian community. It was about the way in which the church needs to grow closer together in order to grow deeper. And I was asked by a group of Methodists in Portland, Maine, if I would come across the country and if I would talk about the book that came out of my dissertation called It Takes a Church to Raise a Christian. So I spent the entire day with them. I did three keynote talks, one on the kingdom of God, one on Christian community, one on, uh, on spiritual formation. I brought them all together. I finished, and at the end of the day, they asked if I would do a Q&A with anybody who wanted to come just to answer questions, kind of like we'll do at the end of the time here. And what I learned from my wife, she's a therapist, and so my wife taught me this. In groups of 60 or so or bigger, all the extroverts shine and all the introverts hide, and everybody likes it that way. So Q&A is oftentimes extrovert Q&A, and we always count on the extroverts to hold the day, and we're going to do so in a moment. But at this particular time, because I only had about 60 folks, what I decided to do is gather up all the questions, and then we would try to decide together what questions we all wanted to talk about. And what I found was this, is that when I asked them, okay, we've now talked about the kingdom of God, spiritual formation, and Christian community, so what do you all want to talk about? 59 out of the 60 all had the same question. What can we do to keep our churches from dying? This was a disruption of my plans. I had come there to talk about the church going deeper, not bigger. About the church being more connected in more sense of community, not more outreach and more evangelism. I didn't know what to, what to do at this moment, but what it taught me was that in every given gathering, there is always a group of people that whatever your agenda is, there's always a deeper agenda that people show up with, the one that is actually keeping them up at night, the one that they are anxious about, the one that they're paying attention to, and it's oftentimes not the one you planned. So what I discovered at this time is I began to pay attention to this notion. This was in the Atlantic Northeast. This is in Portland, Maine. And this was in the early 2000s, and this was where we were beginning to already get in touch with the fact that many of our most iconic denominations that had been so powerful during the 20th century were already beginning to feel the pain and the problem of, being, of the changing demographics. So go with me, if you will, from Portland, Maine to Alabama where a friend of mine is about to retire, I think this month, at the end of this month, he retires after over a 45-year career. 
I was spent some time with him several years ago. We had one of those gatherings after one of our conference meetings, and we were sitting there late in the evening having some refreshments, and I asked him about the way in which the church had changed in his lifetime. And I said, you know, I, I, I'm in a place like California. We talk about church change all the time. What's it like been for you in a place like Alabama? And his answer to me was this. He said, look, it's easy to think that things haven't changed much in places like the South, but let me just tell you this. Here's the biggest change that we experienced. Forty years ago, in a place like Alabama, we didn't even keep track of membership or roles or worship attendance. We didn't have to. Because if a man, man, skipped church on Sunday, his boss asked him about it at work on Monday. When you live in a world in which the the local business community supports the church in that way, guess what it does to church attendance? And what he was talking about was the way in which culture supported Christianity and about the way in which this has become a change in all places, even in places like the Bible Belt or even in places like Alabama that you can think about as the belt buckle of the Bible Belt. So what it becomes for us is a way to think about uh, those kinds of changes. If you ever come and visit me in in Pasadena, I can show you a copy of the Los Angeles Times from December 1963. In December 1963, I have a copy of it because someone gave it to me because on the back page of the front section of the LA Times in December 1963, there's an article on the then 9,000 member Hollywood Presbyterian Church, the church that was the largest Presbyterian church in the denomination in 1963. A church that when I served there had about 4,000 members. Today has, about, has under 1,000, about 600 in worship. The reason I kept it, however, is that there is a box right there in the LA Times that it used to publish for you a week's worth of daily Bible readings. If you can remember when the Los Angeles Times or the New York Times or the Washington Post helped you with your morning quiet time, then you can remember what it was like when the church gave the world a home court advantage where the world gave the church a home court advantage. And that's exactly this world, this world of Christendom that, we, that most of us have been trained for. This world in which not everybody is a Christian. In 1963, Billy Graham's um, crusades were at an all-time high. But that the church had a home court advantage in culture. Culture supported Christianity. So I, I walked around today in Springfield like I often do in most places, and I found a really similar thing. There, uh, it's amazing that when you can walk down into almost any town, you'll find a town square. Oftentimes there is a town square with a statue of the most famous dead person from the town, from the history. There's a library, there's a courthouse, and then there's the first church who ever got here first. And from what I can tell in Springfield, the Methodists beat the Baptists because closer to downtown is the, is the, first, the Methodist church than there is the Baptist church. And it's because even back then, when everybody was laying out a city plan, not that everybody was a Christian, but that everybody believed that what was the center of society needed to be law, education, and religion, and that that religion was a Christian religion. So, um, so what, I exper- what we experienced in this, this moment is the, not just this moment, what I experienced in that moment is the awareness that the, what has changed significantly is the context that we do our ministry. Now I'm talking to a bunch of clergy in the Methodist church. This is not new news to you. But this is radical news to many people in our congregations. And it's completely disruptive news to our seminaries where I live today. In 2010, Fuller Seminary did a survey of its uh, alums. And one of the things that we discovered, now this, here's a little inside baseball for you. If your seminary ever sends you a survey, the people who are sending it is the development office. It's the people who raise the money for the seminary. Why? Because every seminary, every university has a metric of what they expect their alums to be giving by a certain time. And in 2010, Fuller ran these numbers and realized that we, we, we have 40,000 alums all over the world. We're in 400 different countries. We got people who are in lots of different places. And the question they were trying to figure out was this, why aren't you all giving us as much money as we planned for you to give us? <laughs> but you can't ask that, that directly. So what you do is you pay a high-priced consultant to ask that question for you. And what the high-priced consultant knows how to do is to come in the back door and they start by asking this question. How do you feel about Fuller Seminary? And here's what we heard from our alums. We love Fuller Seminary. 
Some of our best memories come from when we were in seminary. I met my spouse in seminary. I love the professors that I had in seminary. I have a special book in my office of all my seminary professors' books. Every time a new book comes out from, some, from one of my professors, I buy it again. I love it. I want to come back and get a t-shirt. We love Fuller Seminary. But seminary didn't prepare me for this world I'm in today. And here's the disruption. We were trained for that Christendom world. And in many places, we keep training and acting as if we're still in that world. What Daryl Guter, formerly from Princeton Seminary, did it is this way. If Western societies have become post-Christian mission fields, then how can traditional churches become then missionary churches? When the mission field is no longer across seawater, but across the sidewalk, and very often sitting across you at the dinner table, then what does it mean for the church's presence in that community? And how do we change the church for this world we're in today? And that brings us to the problem, change. One of, when I worked with a consulting group, we used to put it this way, the fundamental task of leadership is distinguishing between what needs to be preserved and what needs to change. This means that in every gathering of your council, in every group of people making a decision, in everything you, you do, leadership starts in discernment. It starts with having to decide, what are we going to preserve? Because if we lose this, we lose something of who we are. And what are we going to change? Because if we don't change it, we'll lose the opportunity to continue to do the thing that we care about so much. So what I want you to do is recognize how difficult a decision this is to make. Here's what one church, let me just give you one example, see if you can see it on the screen. You may not be able to, but we'll, we'll, you'll make the point. Here's what one church decided was so important that they would etch it in stone. See if you can spot it. Can you see it from where you are? So let me just give you a background about this in case this hasn't, doesn't make sense to you. This is a wealthy church. It was in the, in the northeastern part of the United States. At one time, Billy Graham called this church the leading church in America. It had so much money that when they built their cathedral, they wanted to build it to rival the great cathedrals of Europe. And so they got an architect who was a genius at Gothic design, and it's beautiful. And look at the intricate detail you can see just even over in the arches. The windows are all Tiffany stained glass windows. And even today, they do tours of the sanctuary as one of the best examples of Tiffany stained glass window work in a church. But, but this is, a couple of things you need to know is, first of all, this is a Presbyterian church which means that when it was making decisions, every decision had to be made by a committee. I don't know how you Methodists do it, but we can't make any decision without a committee. So imagine that there was a building committee that got together to make its decisions about what they were gonna put over the front door. What was going to be etched in stone over the front door? And this is a Presbyterian church which are notoriously cheap, even when we have lots of money, so they're not going to waste one single letter. They're going to make this the most efficient and cost-efficient sign they can ever make. And so what they decided, what they would put over the front door that every visitor would see until Jesus comes back, is that you would know that this is the first Presbyterian church kind of like the Ohio State University or something. Like, like it's, it doesn't have to say where. We all know where we're sitting. And that there will be, until Jesus comes back, a morning service at 1045 and an evening service at 745. And we don't even have to say which day, do we? Now, the reason why I show this is a couple things. One is that I know the pastor of this church today, and the pa this church today has three different services on three different days in three different languages, something they never could have imagined 100 years ago. And to remind us that what we think will never change 100 years from now, people could be laughing at us. But the other reason why this is just so profound to me is that I also know the person who was the pastor of this church during the 1970s. And in the 1970s, his first pastoral crisis is when he had to lead the church to close the evening service. Because the church got disrupted by a radical new innovation called 60 Minutes. When the 60 Minutes television show became a big hit, it changed television viewing habits for the entire country. And Sunday night now came, became, for upper middle class and upper class folks who had televisions, it now became family viewing night, family television night. 
And so for wealthier congregations in certain places where, where television became really important, it began to disrupt it, and this church had to close. Can you imagine what it would be like to be the senior pastor who has to close down the service that pe- the earlier generations believed would be here until Jesus came back? What this points to me is the fact that the challenges of innovation and the challenges of disruption have been with us forever and how profoundly hard change is. The fundamental task of leadership is distinguishing between what needs to be preserved and what needs to be changed. 